Hey DCF, Pastor Brad here. Hope you had a fantastic weekend and are having a great start to your week. Um, I'm coming to you this morning just again encouraging us as a church to be a people who are pursuing Christ in our life, to be prioritizing that within our days, within our weeks. Um, oftentimes we see and, and Christians have a reputation for being people who act one way on a Sunday. They they take kind of religious activity seriously on Sundays, and then, you know, Monday through Saturday is kind of a free-for-all. Do what you want. Uh, there's really no connection between Sunday uh, and then the rest of our week. And so as, as disciples of Christ, man, far be it from us that it would be said of us that um, Sunday is the only day in which uh, Jesus and his kingdom matter to us. We want to be a people who see Jesus as the priority of our life and his kingdom having come and desiring that it continues to come being the priority of our life. And therefore, it's necessary that we continue to remain attached to the vine. Jesus says, remain in me and I in you and you will bear much fruit. We, he gives us the visual, the image of a vine and its branches. And we need to be taking the nourishment from that vine as the branches that come off from it day by day. Otherwise, if you aren't nourished, you get weak, you fail, you dry up, and eventually you die. You need to be nourished. And so every day is another opportunity for us to be in God's word and to be in prayer, uh, seeking the Lord and desiring to have fellowship with Christ. Uh, it's not to check a box. It's, it's not to um, be able to say to your pastor or your small group, yep, I did my devotions today or this week. It's to have fellowship with Jesus um, in the same way that if you go weeks and months without having any conversation with your spouse, that relationship will feel dry and, and shriveled up. So too, uh, we must maintain the intentionality within our relationship with Christ by spending time with him day by day. So I just want to encourage you to do that. We want to be a people who do that, who aren't just marked by Sunday activity, but um, see all of worship, all of life as an opportunity to worship um, through surrender to Christ. I come to you today with Lord's Day 19, <clears throat> and we're getting to the end of the middle section of the Apostles' Creed within the section, second section of the Heidelberg Catechism on salvation or grace, and that's that middle portion of the title, or the Apostles' Creed, sorry, is on Jesus, right? So the first part's on the Father, the second part's on the Son, Jesus and his work throughout history to come and to redeem a people for himself. And then the third section is going to move into uh, what does life look like after he has ascended um, to heaven and the Holy Spirit has been poured out in life in the church. So we're going to get there starting next week. But today is the last day that talks about af what happened after the ascension. Okay, and, and so um, he ascended to heaven, and then it says, And he sat down at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. And so we've got really two things that Lord's Day 19 is highlighting. The sitting on the throne and the coming again of Christ to judge the living and the dead. Um. And so I love the way that the Catechism addresses both of these questions and their significance for us as believers, as Christians, and why this matters so deeply for us. This is not just theological uh, uh, jargon that tries to make people feel smart and intellectually superior. No, this, is, this stuff matters for our life. And so the question is, why does it matter? How does it affect every day that I try to live? And so here's the first question that... He is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. What, what does that mean? Why does that matter? Well, in Hebrews, we read this in the first chapter, that Jesus sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to the angels as the name that he has inherited is as much excellent, much more excellent than theirs. That's chapter 1, verses 3 to 4. Sitting down. Um, we think of sitting down as an opportunity to rest. That's not necessarily, that is not what, um, is meant by him having sat down at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. It, it, it's more like, think of that movie that you've probably seen uh, where there's a courtroom scene 
and the um, the prosecution, uh, the the attorney, he's up there and he's delivering his final uh, his final case, his final uh, statement to the jury, and it's just one of those like convicting, compelling moments where you're like, oh man, I'm whatever you're trying to get me to vote, I'm voting because you have persuaded me of your argument. And then he and then the the camera goes over to him and he sits down. And you're like, you can exhale. And it's this moment where like, it's so obvious that the mission that he was sent to do has been completed. And that's really what the idea of sitting down at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty is indicating. It's not that he's resting because he's tired. It's that he has completed the work he was sent to do. Um, all that was necessary to happen for our salvation has now been accomplished. And he returns back to the Father and sits down at the right hand of God. Therefore, therefore, we can have the utmost confidence that whether in life or in death, by belonging to Jesus Christ, our eternity is secured because his work was satisfactory. His work did everything we needed it to do. So that though our rebellion and sin cast us out of the presence of God in the garden in Genesis 3, he is now preparing a place for us in the new heavens and the new earth where we will spend all eternity with him. And so though our sin causes us to doubt, though at moments we're overcome with grief at how, man, am I really, how could God save me? How could God, how could I really be a child of God as I've continue to struggle with this. I continue to struggle with this. I fell into this trap again. I, I, I yelled at my kids again. I, I had that lustful thought again. I, I, um, I continue to hold on to hope for these things that I know will not satisfy me, and, and, you, and we repent, but we can know that Christ has accomplished the work necessary to forgive those things because he has sat down. His work was sufficient. There's nothing else that needs to happen besides faith, in that work for us to be saved. And so you can have deep assurance in your life that even as we continue to struggle with sin, Christ has accomplished the work necessary and has sat down as indication that his work is sufficient. And then it comes and says, how does Christ's return to judge the living and the dead comfort you? Which is, it's really an interesting way of, of phrasing it, but again, this catechism is all about comfort. What is your only comfort is the first question in life and in death. What comforts you? And right here it's saying the idea that Jesus is going to come back to judge the living and the dead is somehow providing comfort for me. Is that true? Well, for some in the world, that's certainly true. Again, if we belong to Jesus Christ, we can have comfort that he's coming again. But he's coming as a judge. He came in his first coming as a redeemer, as the Messiah who was coming to make atonement for sin. When he comes again, he's going to come as a judge. And for some of us, that is absolutely fantastic news because he comes as a judge who has already been our attorney and pleaded our case before God the Father and has acquitted us of all charges by his own punishment for us. And so in his coming again, we don't have fear. We have longing expectation for what he will usher in as the judge. Um, one time I got a, when I was younger, I got a speeding ticket and got pulled over by uh, a police officer and gave me a ticket. And um, through the course of some conversation with the police officer between the ticket and the trial, he agreed to move it to a different type of ticket. I forget what it was called exactly, but it basically was like more money, no points, right? Probably many of you have been through this, helps with insurance costs, whatever. So he was going to change it. And so um, I came to my trial date and I walked in that courtroom and there was a sense of reverence that I had for the judge because it was my first time ever in a courtroom and I knew... Uh, you know, that, that I, I don't know, remember if it was a man or a woman, but that, that individual, that judge is someone to be honored and respected. And so there was that sense of reverence 
uh, for that, that individual and the position they held. But I walked in that courtroom without fear because I already knew that the officer who was the one who ultimately determined my fate had, um, had communicated with the judge and had ruled in my favor to release the points and to change my um, to change my charge, not to not guilty, but to a different. So this is not a perfect example, but in a sense, we we understand. I walked in without fear. I didn't I didn't have to wonder what what the verdict was going to be. I already knew what it was. And so too, as we anticipate Jesus coming again to judge the living and the dead, for those of us who have already been declared justified, not guilty, righteous in His sight. We don't fear the judge who is to come, but we look forward to the day when he will come and bring an end to all of the suffering in this earth. No more cancer, no more broken relationships, no more pain, no more tears, no more uh, relational strife, no more anxiety, uh, no more addiction, no more. The judge will come and he will declare those who are clothed in Christ's righteousness, not guilty and sin will be done away with. And we will exist for all eternity in the new heavens and the new earth, clothed with the righteousness of Christ and unable to sin from that moment forward. And what a glorious day that will be. And so as Christians, we live in the hope of Jesus coming again when he will do away with all the suffering that we experience now in this life. And so may, may his work, may the gospel continue to bring you great comfort as you suffer and, and endure trials now. Um, may it also give you great hope for what is to come as we look forward to a day when, when all suffering will be done away with. Have a great rest of your week loving and serving the Lord, and I'll see you on Sunday.